Um, and that's a natural feeling. They want to protect you. They don't want you to know what they experienced. Uh, in most cases. I mean, I'm not going to say in every case, but in most cases, they're not going to want to talk about what they but saw. They're also not going to be home for a long time. Right, yeah, that's true. And hopefully what they're doing is they're talking about it with their, you know, their other sol the other soldiers, but yeah. there's no guarantee that they wanna, they'll, they'll be able to do that either. Uh, depend and some of that depends on the leadership that they have in the military. There are some, uh, when I talk about, the, I like to talk about the fire department a lot because it's really clear. There are some lieutenants that are really, really sensitive to what their, sol their firefighters are feeling and they check in on them and they ask them. Bureaucracy oftentimes can be the enemy of soldiers who are in crisis around trauma because the bureaucracy can sometimes exacerbate the whole, the whole issue of avoidance. They're just getting on with the next thing. Right. Literally, in right. my daughter's case. Okay. Task and purpose. Right, that it's been dealt with. The particular group of soldiers that were at the unit, they packed up and left. Right. That was never discussed. Right. And in her case, you know, it was like right. Okay. Task, task, and purpose. They have to, yes. they have to move Are on. Are psychologists in the army? Like so, <laughs> like I know my son, he's in a unit that specializes in getting bodies. Mm -hmm. But he's in a unit like that, so they have psychologists, but there wasn't enough of them to. So all of the soldiers. That were down in Ote Baza. Mm -hmm. I mean, all. But many other soldiers who never do this were doing it too. I'm assuming that they they didn't have anyone to do it. But they won't be home for a month. Mm -hmm. yeah. What? Yeah, who's doing it? Oh, everyone's doing it. Talking about enough. Like I think you feel they have psychologists, but also they've been prepared before. Mm. He was supposed to do that anyway. Right. Well, there's a difference between someone who's a doctor and who's uh, worked on a cadaver and versus a 18 year old who's never seen a dead body before. Yeah. Right? I mean, am I no. off base here? No. What? A hundred percent. Right. Seeing a dead body, I, I think is. And we're not just to, to, again, we're not just talking about a dead body. We're talking about massacre. Mass, massacre. We're talking about, you know, what, you know, well, different... Well, you know, put it all into, also into perspective. They've never seen a dead body when they see one. And then it turns, it could be traumatic. And mm -hmm. then, as you say, it's a nor it is a normal part of life, but most people don't interact or come encountered with a dead body mm -hmm. unless they're a medical professional or they're working in a morgue or they're doing mm -hmm. something... In mm -hmm. that capacity, right? So, well, well even no one has ever been in a situation like this. this right, not certain. No, they, 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 but the only thing I would say is that one time for my eldest son who's in the army, and I said he comes home and he doesn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was coming back from a work trip, had a different taxi driver, and he goes, he doesn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. and he goes, he'll never talk about it with you. This is an Israeli Israeli mm -hmm. because we'll talk about it with his friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's no. One of her brothers, his, he also had never heard a word about anything he ever did in the army. All of a sudden, my other brother joined the army, now they're talking, they are talking about their, their experiences in the mm. army and like telling what, what they did. Because like, he won't share it with the rest of us. He'll share this it with is so gruesome. I don't know mm -hmm. that they're talking to each other mm -hmm. about it. And no, there's no guarantee that they'll talk about it with their friends. Right. That's just said, yeah. I just right. worked with another son of mine. Yeah. Right. He said he's not doing this, but when boys came back from stable who had it, <coughs> he said they went. They just couldn't speak. Right, they had ten thousand miles there. Yeah. Right. My, my, son, my eldest son just said they took them two or three days. To, they weren't doing this. They were doing something else. Took them to, and they're starting to. Yeah, but that's called that's normal. So right. sometimes what happens is. The shock of what happens, you deal with. You don't. You don't deal with it, and then you go through a grieving process, a normal grieving process. And and for some people, they're going to process it, and they're going to make, you know, they'll they'll find some sort of meaning that they can, you know. So so I I keep going back to the firefighters or the police officers that I work with. One of the things that they always tell me is this is their job, and the way they deal with it is they know that they didn't cause the situation. They're there to do whatever they can to make the situation better. 
Now, in this particular case, the cases that we're dealing with here, um, there is a lot of times there was nothing that they can do. And I think that that feeling of helplessness actually uh, is worse than if you if you actually manage to save a life or do something that may so you have to give so you have to find a way to provide meaning to what people did in these situations that makes it makes it better um, with PTSD treatment what I do and this is what I personally do there are a couple of, there are various ways of treating PTSD but what I do is called prolonged exposure therapy um, and in prolonged exposure therapy, we, re we go over what happened repeatedly. We make them talk about, now, now some people, and actually this, this treatment was actually developed by Edna Foa, who is an Israeli. So, um, so if you've ever heard of Edna Foa, that she's, she's a, an expert in PTSD. I was trained by her and her colleagues. Uh, she works at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, we're working with uh, sexual uh, vic victims of sexual abuse, um, and so in some of the thing, the videos that we watched, you know, people will say, "Well, isn't this isn't this cruel to make people go over it um, over and over again?" In fact, over the course of a, of a six or eight sessions, we will have people record their trauma, listen to their trauma over and over again. And now the amazing thing about that process is that by the sixth or seventh session of listening to what they went through, they begin to become bored with the trauma. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is that they're beginning to find, and, and they find a place where they can put it. I had a Vietnam veteran who was, he had PTSD for a good 40 years he actually came to me in my office. I remember sitting in my office in uh, the VA. He knocked on my door and he said, Dr. Rickwitz, I think I've heard that you can help people with PTSD. Um, he said, I'm at my wit's end. Um, can you help me? And so, um, so I told him about prolonged exposure therapy. And this was, this was very early when I started doing this treatment. And he, um, we had about 15 sessions, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to kind of give you a sense of what the change was. Around, he, he was a, in a helicopter, and his, really his best friend was in another helicopter, and they were, in North, they were, they were fighting the North Vietnamese, and he, there, his friend's helicopter went down, and he was on the 50 cal, and he was trying to, the, the NVA were coming out and they were like, they were mutilating bodies. I just put it out there. And um, he's firing the 50 cal and he's thinking to himself, I didn't do enough to save him. There was nothing he could do, right? Uh, but he carried a letter from his friend for, in his pocket for like, like literally for 40 years. And, um, and he'd gone through alcoholism, he became sober, he just, he just, you know, but he, he couldn't go out. Around the fifth or sixth sessions, he came in to, came in, he used to have to, his wife used to have to, you know, really push him in. And he said, um, I just want you to know, I went to the mall this week and I went shopping by myself. And this was like, like a tremendous breakthrough for him. He was, you know, that for him to be able to go shopping was like a big deal. And he came in for about 15 sessions. And then every once in a while, he'd drop by my office and tell me how he was doing. And, um, and really, the, it, so what changed for him? What changed for him was at some point when he was repeating the story, he realized there was absolutely nothing he could do. He was not God. He could not save his friend. He did everything he could in his power. And really, what he really recognized was that the amount of time he spent on that 50 cal shooting was pro what he thought was forever 